Is this okay? Okay, thanks. Yeah, so uh, thanks Tom and Sergey for inviting me. Um, I guess one of the benefits of this COVID period was this sort of international online seminars and it's great that you guys are just continuing this, uh, this useful feature, uh, even though that COVID is receding a little bit. Uh, yeah, so what I'm going to talk about is a, um, a survey talk about uh, quantum machine learning, or maybe I should say more precisely quantum learning theory. Uh, from the perspective of theoretical computer science. Um, uh, and this is going to be a somewhat biased view. I'm, I'm largely gonna talk about things that, that I have worked on because those are the things I, I know best and know how to explain. Uh, quantum machine learning is a huge field. A lot of it is not very theoretical. Um, so there's much more out there than what I'm gonna talk about. Um, Right, so machine learning, as we all know, since the kind of uh, resurgence of uh, deep learning uh, around 10 years ago, this is, this is a massively successful and influential uh, area. Right, a, a big, big shocking breakthrough was when uh, computers started to defeat the best Go players around 2016. This was completely unexpected. Go was supposed to be a super hard problem, much harder than chess. And nowadays computers, thanks to deep learning, are just uh, way ahead of us, probably for now until forever. And a few years later, people started to do quantum machine learning, quantum versions of machine learning. And there's a lot of sort of interesting ideas that started to come up around 2013, 14, 15. Um, and I think this is a very interesting field, but it's also a bit of an overhyped field. Right? So this is often mentioned by, by startup companies and, and newspaper journalists who are very enthusiastic about the area. And they somehow present it as um, an obvious killer app of quantum computers, some obvious area where quantum computers are great and are going to outshine classical computers. So, so let's just see what we actually have in, in, the, in this area. So we have a lot, and I mean really hundreds of papers of, of kind of hard to assess claims about speed ups for natural learning related problems using variational quantum circuits. Uh, which with a bit of marketing finesse are sometimes called quantum neural networks. I won't say too much about it. I'll, I'll mention them briefly at the end. Uh, we have proven claims about uh, like quantum improvements uh, in time complexity for learning or in sample complexity for learning. But this is often for somewhat artificial problems that were kind of cooked up to show separations. Uh, and very often these problems also assume quantum data. Uh, that's uh, like data in a quantum form. And I'll say much more about that later. Uh, and then we have some proven um, like algorithms that provably work, uh, but that were subsequently dequantized in the sense that somebody came up with a quantum machine learning system. And there was a famous uh, recommend quantum recommendation system due to Kirinidis and Prakash that was very nice. And then Yuen Teng, a few years later, uh, she actually showed that um, you could basically do the same thing, um, um, maybe slightly slower with a classical computer. So this, this is called sort of dequantization of quantum machine learning. And, and some parts of quantum machine learning have been hit by dequantization. And I don't think this is a bad thing. It means, it means that somehow quantum computing has helped uh, to sort of increase our understanding for classical machine learning. But it's cert like certainly these applications are not a killer app for building large scale quantum computers. Um, so what I'm going to talk in this in this talk, as I mentioned, I'm sort of going to focus on theoretical aspects of quantum machine learning. Right. So the question is, um, what could uh, quantum computers do to help machine learning? And machine learning, if you want to see sort of a, a first order approximation, you can think of it as data plus optimization. Right. The data, sort of the resource that you're given to work from, uh, in which you want to find all sorts of patterns and and hidden hidden uh, correlations. And then there's the optimization process that works on the data and tries to extract, uh, tries to extract um, information from the data, or maybe try to find a model or a hypothesis that has uh, sort of that has minimal or almost minimal error on the data, right? And then you cross your fingers and you hope that this this model will actually generalize beyond the given data. Um, and if you think about quantum, um, you can make the data quantum and or the optimization quantum. Um, and there's actually like four possibilities here, classical learner, quantum learner, classical data, quantum data. Um, the, the upper left box, of course, that is just the usual classical machine learning. I'm not gonna talk about it. Uh, the bottom left um, box, I put a question mark there, like this is a classical learner with quantum data. 
Uh, and there are some sensible things you could put here, for instance, if you're trying to learn Hamiltonians from quantum measurement data. Now, I'm not going to talk about it, but there's some interesting recent work about this. Uh, what I will talk about is uh, a quantum learner, so a quantum algorithm that is doing the learner, either given classical data or quantum data. So those are the, the two boxes that I'll focus on. Uh, and, and machine learning is, is typically sort of subdivided into three areas. One is supervised learning. Right? So these three areas depend on, on what kind of access you have to your data. And in supervised learning, you're given labeled data. And a, a common, common example of that is um, you're trying to learn some animal and, and you're given pictures that are annotated in the sense that there's sort of a label for each picture. Maybe, maybe human labels these pictures saying, okay, this is a picture of the animal you're trying to learn. And this other picture is not a, a picture of the animal you're trying to learn, right? So that's an example of, of labeled data. And this is sort of the most useful uh, or most structured kind of data. It's also, we're assuming usually that these labels are more or less correct. So there is, there is kind of an objective truth out there that's provided by the labels. Uh, and here I'm going to talk about uh, quantum pack learning from quantum data, and I'll present both some positive and some negative results about this. Then there's unsupervised learning. So there your, your data is unlabeled. You're just sort of given this bag of data and good luck with it. Try to find patterns in it. Um, and here I'll talk about some applications uh, of quantum linear algebra, in particular an early one, which I kind of like, uh, which is called quantum principle component analysis. Uh, and then the third common sub area of, um, of, of machine learning, both classical and quantum is reinforcement learning. And reinforcement learning is sort of the most complicated setting. It's where you kind of interact with your environment and you get rewards and penalties depending on whether you successfully or not so successfully interact with the environment. And you're trying to learn by sort of, of course, increasing your rewards and reducing your penalties. That's what humans do. That's what everybody does. And this is also a very interesting area, but I won't cover it just to, because I only have like 55 minutes. Right, so the focus uh, initially will be especially on, on supervised learning, learning from labeled data. And this is a, a talk from a theoretical and mathematical perspective. So I'm going to need a model of supervised learning, like a mathematical model of what it means to learn from, from uh, labeled data. Um, and the, 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 the most basic model in computational learning theory for supervised learning is the so-called probably approximately correct model due to Leslie Valiant in the 80s. It's called the PEC model. And this takes a little bit of getting used to if you've never seen it before, but at the end of the day, I think this is a pretty intuitive model. Like what you really want to do at the end of the day is you want to output some hypothesis, which is probably approximately correct compared to whatever it is you're trying to learn. And what you're trying to learn in this setting is a concept, which for simplicity, we'll just think of as a function with Boolean outputs, right? So just think of, uh, let's say, um, labeling pictures as, okay, this is the animal you're trying to learn, and this is not the animal you're trying to learn. There's just two labels. You can generalize this, but I'm going to focus on the simple case with two labels. Uh, and this, this, this function, uh, uh, its domain um, could be anything, but for concreteness, you can think about it, for instance, as a set of binary strings. For instance, if your inputs are labeled pictures of, let's say, 100 by 100 black and white uh, pixels, then, then your, every X would be uh, 10,000 bits and it would have a positive or negative label associated with it. So that's one example. The concept class is, is a set of such functions. Uh, and and you, this is sort of meant to restrict uh, the possible things you're trying to learn because if, if there's no constraint whatsoever on what you're trying to learn, your learning problem is way too hard. So you somehow have to have some sort of knowledge about the object you're trying to learn. Uh, and in pack learning, we do that by saying that the function f that we're trying to learn comes from some known class C. And the class C is much, much smaller than the set of all possible Boolean functions. So it could, for instance, correspond to the class of small circuits or DNF formulas or low depth decision trees. So you're trying to learn such an object. And you know in advance that what you're trying to learn is such an object. Uh, so we want to learn an unknown function from this concept class. This is called the target function. Uh, and we want to learn it from examples. And the examples are just a form like X with a label. That's one example. Um, so you're, it's like if you think of the domain as the Boolean cube of n bits, then you're sort of seeing one line from the truth table of the function you're trying to learn. 
Um, and we need to make some assumption on, on, on these examples. And what we're assuming is that uh, the X is distributed according to some unknown distribution D, which kind of represents the world or the internet or nature or whatever process it is that sort of generates examples for us. Right, so we have a source of these examples. The examples will be IID, uh, identical, uh, independent, identically distributed, and they will all have the distribution D on this string X. Right, so here's a little example. So suppose you're trying to uh, learn from pictures. So here's a simple labeled example. You're given this picture and you're given the label that this is a positive example of the thing you're trying to learn. Right, and here's another one. And this is a, a negative example of what you're trying to learn. And here's another one, and this is a positive example of what you're trying to learn. And here's a fourth example, and this is a negative example. Uh, and so what could you infer from this? Well, these four examples are maybe not that much information yet, uh, but at the end of the day, what you would like to learn is some sort of function that recognizes pictures of wolves, right? You want, you want to learn a function from this, which if you put a pic picture into it um, that, that represents a wolf, then the label should be yes or plus and otherwise it should be minus, right? And if, if you manage to do this from a small number of examples, you've effectively learned to recognize wolves, which is a useful skill in nature. Right, so the goal is using a bunch of, of IID examples of this form, each example is of the form X comma FX. Uh, the learner for the concept class, which is really a learner for an unknown element of the concept class, they should output an hypothesis H that's probably approximately correct. And so this is the core notion of this PEC model of learning. And what does this mean? So we measure the error of the hypothesis H with respect to the target function as the probability that it kind of uh, misclassifies a new example. So if I give you another X distributed according to the same distribution D, then the error would be the probability that my hypothesis H, the thing that I, that I sort of inferred that I learned, uh, mis mislabels uh, this X. In other words, it gives a different output from what, what F would do. And being approximately correct means having small error. And being probably approximately correct means that, uh, that you output a hypothesis which probably has small error. And in the usual setting of PEC learning, you want a learning algorithm uh, which is actually correct for every possible fun target function in the concept class C and for every possible distribution D on the, the, that generates the data. Right, so if you stare at this definition for a while, uh, at some point the acronym PEC starts to make sense. Uh, your hypothesis H that you produce uh, based on the sample that you're given should be probably, meaning with high probability, approximately correct. Right, so there's two parameters here, delta and epsilon. Delta kind of measures your error probability. Think of it as 1%, you can fix it to be 1%. And epsilon is the more important of the two parameters. It kind of uh, quantifies your generalization error, like how well you can predict future examples. And you would like this to be small, right? The smaller epsilon is, the better your hypothesis is for predicting the future or predicting the labels of future examples. Uh, and let me just emphasize here that, uh, that it is important that the error is measured according to the same distribution um, that, uh, that generated your data. You know, if, if, you, if you take a course and you're doing an exam where the exam questions are totally different from the stuff that you saw in the course, that's not fair. So it's very reasonable to be tested or evaluated according to the same distribution that generated your data. So this is Valiant spec model. Uh, it's very famous. Uh, you can generalize it in all sorts of directions. This is just a basic model. Um, and for our purposes, it's interesting. You can try to generalize this to quantum. Right, and so much interesting quantum machine learning uh, assumes, and we'll see again examples later, that, that classical data can be turned into quantum superposition. And in some cases, this is possible. In some cases, it is not. Uh, but from a theory perspective, uh, it, it makes mathematical sense to just assume that your data is given in a quantum form. So let's try to, to circumvent this problem of putting classical data into superposition by assuming that instead of giving random examples, we're being given quantum superposition examples. So that's something like this. This was introduced by Bishuti and Jackson only one year after Shor's algorithm came out. Right, so what, what we now assume is that an example is not a random, random variable, but it's sort of the quantum object that's, that precedes a classical example. It's the superposition uh, where the square roots of the probabilities are the amplitudes, right? And, and I think mathematically, this is a very, very reasonable generalization of, um, of a classical random example. 
whether it's practical is a very different uh, issue. Like uh, I think in many cases, this is not a practical assumption, uh, but in some cases it will be. I mean, if you have some sort of physical process that generates quantum states of this form, then that's going to fit the model. But like I said, this is a talk from a theory perspective. So I'm just going to sort of close my eyes for the time being to practical issues and assume that my examples are of this quantum form instead of a probabilistic form. Right, and of course, if I give you such a quantum example, you can sort of like immediately measure it, right? You can like, if you can't sort of stop yourself, you can look at the example, it's gonna to collapse to a classical example. And the probabilities of, of the X comma FX pairs that you'll see is exactly what it would be for a classical example. Right, so such a quantum state is clearly at least as useful or at least as powerful as a classical random example. But of course, the, the real question is like, what more could we do with this? Of course, we shouldn't try to measure this stuff immediately. We should do some fancy quantum operations on this to, to extract more information than we could from classical examples. Uh, and on the next slides, I'm going to, uh, to show some examples, uh, uh, let, me, let me say cases where, where indeed such quantum examples are useful for the particular case of the uniform distribution D. Right, and notice that this doesn't really fit exactly what I required in the PEC model. In the PEC model, what we really want is distribution independent learners, which are guaranteed to work for every possible data generating distribution. Uh, and what I'm gonna present on the next slide is weaker than that. Uh, it, it just works when your dis data generating distribution is uniform. But if your data generating distribution is uniform, there are some nice quantum things you can do. Right, so this is just a repetition from the, uh, from the previous slide, what a quantum example looks like in the case where your distribution is, is uniform. It's just a uniform superposition over all x comma fx pairs. I'm assuming now that the domain is the Boolean cube of n-bit strings. And let's suppose we don't measure this immediately. Let's suppose we do something else. And, and one thing we can do is called Fourier sampling. And this is essentially due to Bernstein and Vazirani from 93. And the idea is simple, but in some cases quite helpful. So first thing we do is we, we take this state, the example, that's an n plus one qubit state. And with a little trick with probability one half, you can actually put this, this bit value fx as a phase. Remember, I've assumed that the values of f are plus or minus one. Um, and you can, you know, can actually convert this. Uh, do you see my mouse pointer, by the way? If I'm moving it like this, yeah, okay, good. So you can convert this n plus one qubit state with good probability into this, this n qubit state, and you know when you succeed it, right? And the good thing here is that the function values fx, they are now amplitudes. Um, and then what can you do? Well, like most early quantum algorithms, we just hit this with a Hadamard transform, um, and that turns it into some other uh, n qubit quantum state with amplitudes, which I'll call f hat of s, and these f hats of s, if you just sort of calculate what the Hanamar transform does, these are exactly the Fourier coefficients of your Boolean function f. And you can now measure the resulting state and you're going to sample an n-bit string s according to the squared Fourier coefficients. Uh, so Fourier analysis tells you that the sum of squares of these coefficients is exactly one. So this is a well-defined probability distribution and you can sample from it. Uh, and the good thing about doing such a Fourier sample is that you sort of get some global information about the function you're trying to, to achieve. You don't see one line x comma fx from the truth table. You see some string s and the probability distribution over the s is kind of depends on the whole truth table. And in some cases, this is just super useful. Let me present two cases where this, this Fourier sampling is super useful. Um, the first example is uh, if, if the concept class uh, whose elements you're trying to learn is the class of linear functions modulo two, right? So let's assume that, that we're only trying to learn functions of this form here. Fx for an n-bit string x is defined to be uh, the parity as a plus or minus of, uh, the, of um, the bits of x that are indexed by some fixed string a. So, so A is a fixed n-bit string, though you can also think of it as selecting a subset of the bits of X. And the value that F takes at a point X um, is, is the parity of the X bits indexed by A as a plus or minus. Right now there's two to the n choices for the string A. So this is a concept class of two to the n functions. And suppose we're trying to learn this, meaning we're getting examples from an unknown linear function. And we try to sort of recognize what the linear function is. Now, 
Linear functions have extremely simple Fourier coefficients. You can just calculate them and they come out very nicely. So if you take such a linear function f and you compute, let's say the Fourier coefficient of the string s, s is an n-bit string, just plug in a definition, uh, fx is minus one to the ax. So you can rewrite it like this. And this is a very simple sum, which is either one or zero. This is sort of uh, either constructive or destructive interference in action. So this, this Fourier coefficient is either one, namely in the special case where S equals the, the hidden string A that determines your linear function and otherwise it's just zero, right? And that means that if you're going to sample according to a distribution where the probabilities are the squared Fourier coefficients, you immediately see from even one example, you, you learn what A is and therefore you identify the linear function you're trying to learn. Um, so this takes you uh, basically just one quantum example, well, okay, one quantum example where the, the bits are in the phase, maybe you need two or three original examples to, to produce such a example where the bits are in the phase uh, and, and order n gates. Uh, if you try to do this classically, if you're trying to learn lin linear functions, you can show that you need at least n uniform random examples, uh, just for information theoretic reasons and, and poly n uh, other operations. And so this is, uh, this is a simple example of a significant speed up in terms of sample complexity. The number of samples classically would be roughly n, quantumly it's a constant. Um, and a more fancy example, and this is the, this is the main result of the original Bishuti and Jackson paper that introduced uh, this, this quantum version of peck learning, uh, is that you can learn disjunctive normal form uh, formulas. These are like depth two Boolean formulas, which are uh, ors of n's. Uh, you can learn those in polynomial time from quantum examples under the uniform distribution. Um, and their algorithm is somewhat more complicated. I'm not going to sketch it in much detail. Let me just say that um, they use two ingredients. One is Fourier sampling. Um, and what Fourier sampling produces in the case where your function is a DNF is it produces a parity function that's, that has, sort of has a non-trivial but not very large correlation with the function you're trying to learn. So you can think of Fourier sampling here as something that produces sort of a weak hypothesis, something that has a small but non-trivial correlation with your target function. And every Fourier sample do, does that for you. Uh, and if you have a sort of a machine that produces weak, weak hypothesis for your target function, there's a general procedure called boosting in classical machine learning that can repeatedly generate such weak hypotheses and combines them into one good hypothesis. Right, so you can combine this, uh, this Fourier sampling with classical boosting to find a good hypothesis H. Uh, and this all works in polynomial time if you're given these uniform quantum examples for your unknown DNF function F. Uh, and DNF is, is one of the holy grails of, of, of classical learning theory. We don't know how to do it in polynomial time classically. The best classical learner takes time roughly n to the log n. Right, so this is actually a super polynomial speed up compared to the best classical learning algorithm. And it's, it's quantum core is again, this Fourier sampling. Um, but both of these examples, they are with respect to a fixed distribution, namely the uniform one, right? So let me pivot back to the original definition of, um, of PEC learning. Let me flesh it by you once more. Right, if you look at the definition at the bottom of this slide here, you really want a learner which looks at its sample, produces a hypothesis H that depends on its sample in such a way that no matter what the target function was and no matter what the data distribution D was, it always outputs, uh, it always with high probability outputs a, a hypothesis with, uh, with small generalization error with small epsilon. Right, and these examples that I showed for the uniform distribution, they only do it for the uniform distribution. Like Fourier sampling works for the uniform distribution and it works very nicely for the uniform distribution. But now you can ask, can you get similar sort of speed ups in, in, in time complexity or sample complexity if you really require your learner to be, uh, to work for every possible data distribution, right? And then you need to look at uh, one of the cornerstones of classical learning theory, something called VC dimension. Because VC dimension uh, of a concept class determines almost exactly how many examples you need to see to satisfy um, the definition of back learning. This distribution independent uh, stringent definition of back learning. Uh, so here's the definition of VC dimension. 
I'll say what it is, but you don't really have to uh, understand it. I mean, just think of it as some sort of combinatorial way to measure how rich your concept class C is. Sort of the more complicated C is, the bigger C is, the larger the, the VC dimension will be. And so it's defined as the largest set uh, in the domain that is shattered by the concept class. And a set being shattered by the concept class means that, um, that every possible labeling of the points in the set is consistent with some concept in your concept class. So that's the definition of VC dimension. I think for the purposes of this slide, I mean, if, you, if you've never seen this before, just think of it as some measure of complexity of your, uh, your concept class. And the beautiful thing is that there's this, this very fun, fundamental theorem in, um, in classical learning theory that, that says that this VC dimension is basically determines almost exactly how up to a constant factor how many examples you need to see if you want to be able to satisfy this definition of um, distribution independent pack learning, right? And I highlight that the important part here, if the VC dimension of your concept class is, is some number D and you want to achieve a generalization error that's at most epsilon, you need roughly D over epsilon examples. This is necessary and sufficient. Uh, and both the upper and the lower bounds here are quite non-trivial to, to prove. Um, Right, so, but uh, the required number of examples in classical pack learning is linear in the VC dimension. And this has been known from the, since the eighties. Actually, I guess the sort of the last log factors were only shaved off maybe five years ago, but um, roughly speaking uh, that, that the data complexity or the sample complexity is like D over epsilon, VC dimension over epsilon. This has been known for a long time. Uh, and with my student uh, Srinivasan Aruna Chalam, uh, we proved uh, five years ago that actually the, exactly the same formula even applies if you're given quantum examples, right? And what this means is that uh, if you care about distribution independent back learning, so you want a quantum learning algorithm uh, which works for every F in your concept class and for every data generating distribution, sample complexity doesn't drop if your examples are, are coherent, if your examples are quantum instead of classical. In fact, if you just care about the number of examples, you might as well just measure those classical examples immediately and don't do anything quantum with it. This is somewhat of a, I would say, disappointing and negative results uh, for distribution independent learning. Quantum examples do not provide reduction in, in sample complexity. Um, so uh, this was, uh, yeah. Um, so we saw examples for learning with respect to the uniform distribution and the negative uh, result for distribution independent learning. But yes. suppose one wants to learn with respect to a fixed distribution D, which is not the uniform one. Do we have any examples of uh, speed ups? Uh, the same lower bound applies. In fact, I wanted to sketch the, uh, the lower bound proof on the next slide and you will see it is actually a fixed distribution and you, can, you, you may just assume that your learning algorithm knows what the distribution D, D is and it's not gonna help it. And do we know of specific distributions other than the uniform, um, like specific ones which are structured and that admit speed ups? Um, you can probably cook up some examples, but the ones that I know are all for the uniform examples. Uh, sorry for the uniform main distribution. natural ones. Yeah, I mean, one interesting question is, for instance, to look at uh, something like uh, efficiently sampleable distributions and then try to prove some positive results there, but I don't think much is known. Um, okay, so let me try to prove a uh, to, pr to prove the, the lower bounds on the quantum sample complexity on the next slide. Notice that the, the upper bound on the quantum sample complexity, the, the fact that this many examples suffice, this already follows from the known classical results, because like I said, you could actually start by just measuring your quantum examples, right? And then, then just apply some classical learning algorithm. And we know that this many classical random examples suffice for pack learning. Maybe not time efficient pack learning, but just information theoretic if you care about how many data points you need. Okay, so, so this com here comes the most technical uh, slide of the talk. And I put some effort into putting this whole lower bound proof on one slide, or at least sort of an overview of it. Right, so, so let's say we have a large set S, which is shattered by C. And I'm assuming for simplicity here that my set has D plus one points instead of D, it doesn't really matter. But my goal now is to show that, um, that a quantum learner uh, which succeeds for an arbitrary data distribution and an arbitrary target concept in C. This proof works for an arbitrary concept class C, by the way. Uh, 
uh, that if, if a learner actually satisfies this, this PEC definition, then the amount of, of quantum examples, the number of quantum examples that it needs to see is roughly D over epsilon. That's what, I'm, what I want to prove here. Epsilon is sort of the generalization error that its hypothesis should have at the end. Right, so here's my fixed distribution. And this also answers Tom's question from just now. This is a fixed distribution. You can actually assume that the learning algorithm knows it, and still it's gonna need a lot of examples. So the distribution is to put actually a lot of weight on the first point on S0. This will get like one minus eight epsilon of the total weight. And then there's D points left and I'm just going to distribute the remaining eight epsilon probability uniformly over those D points. And this is my distribution. It's a fixed distribution. You may even assume that the quantum learning algorithm knows it. Right, so, so what does an epsilon error learner do? It takes some number T of quantum examples as input uh, and it produces a hypothesis H and this hypothesis H, if it has error probability epsilon, uh, like generalization error epsilon, it actually has to predict the correct, correct labels for most of the points S1 up to S, SD. Of course, it's going to predict the correct label for the point S0 because the point S0 has, has almost one of the mass, but even of the remaining points S1 up to SD, which have eight epsilon weight, if your generalization error is epsilon, then the hypothesis has to be correct on seven over eight of those D points, right? So let's assume that, that we have such a learning algorithm and our goal is now to prove a lower bound on the number T, the number of quantum examples that it consumes to prove such a good hypothesis, right? And you can think of this as a so-called approximate state identification problem in the sense that um, you're given T copies of this quantum state, which is an example, uh, and you're supposed to sort of produce a string from this let's say a D bit string, which agrees in seven over eight of the positions with whatever your target function labeled it, right? This is, this is a shattered set, which means that for each of the two to the D possible labelings of the points S1 up to SD, there is a function in my class, which could be the target function. So I better get the labels right of most of those points. And you can think of this as an approximate state identification problem. You're not exactly supposed to fully learn all the D labels. It's an approximate state identification problem. Uh, and we don't have such good tools for analyzing that, but we can actually massage it using some CS tools, uh, tricks to, um, to an exact state identification problem and that we can analyze. And the trick is to use an error correcting code. Um, so for every D bit string, there is going to be a function FMI concept class that has those D labels for the points S1 and to SD. That's because the set S is shattered by the concept class. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to pick a good error correcting code that maps, uh, let's say K bits to D bits. Think of K as something like, uh, like D over four. So it's an error correcting code that kind of blows up uh, K bit string by uh, factor four in such a way that, that any two code words are at a large distance, at a linear distance. Distance um, at least D over four and such codes exist. And because of that, um, let's say if we know that the vector of D labels of our unknown target function is a code word of some, some K bit string Z, then approximating that code word is actually the same as, as exactly identifying the code word. That's because of the beauty of error correcting codes, right? And now we've, we've changed our problem into an exact state identification problem, right? So we kind of restrict the set of possible target hypotheses from the two to the D possible labelings of S1 up to SD to only the two to the K possible labelings that correspond to a code word. So a D bit code word that corresponds to an encoding of a K bit word. So now we have two to the K possible uh, states. So we lost a little bit in the number of possible states, but we have, we have the, the advantage that we now actually require the algorithm to exactly identify uh, which state it is given. Right, and it's given T copies of this state. And T must be good enough to recognize with high probability which of the two to the K possibilities you're given. And you can show that the, the quantum learner that uh, sort of approaches this problem that tries to do any, any kind of measurement on these T copies of this state, it can't do much better than something that's called a pretty good measurement. And the pretty good measurement is pretty good in the sense that it's uh, error probability is pretty close or its success probability is pretty close to the success probability of the best possible measurement. 
Uh, and we can actually analyze with a lot of work, several pages of calculations, we can analyze what the success probability of the pretty good measurement would be on this exact state identification problem. And I will spare you the details, uh, but what comes out is that if the pretty good measurement has high success probability on the state identification problem, then the number of copies that it needs for that is exactly what you want it to be. It's, it's the lower bound um, for the sample complexity that I promised to prove. Right, so this is how you can how you can show uh, lower bounds on um, on um, on uh, sample complexity. You kind of combine TCS tricks like the use of error correcting codes with with physics tricks like the power of the pretty good measurement. Uh, you do a lot of calculations, and the correct bounds pop out. Uh, so this is as much as I wanted to say. I think about these sample complexity bounds. Uh, yeah, at least in the, in the basic PEC model. Let me just say that there is a more realistic learning model, which is called agnostic learning. Um, yeah, in the interest of time, maybe I should go over this quickly. Uh, but agnostic learning is more liberal than, than PEC learning in the sense that it doesn't have to assume that there are sort of, that there is actually a target function F that you're trying to learn. Like you're basically just trying to learn some label that kind of depends on the, on the data X. It could be in some way, for instance, there could be noise in here that's different from the regular PEC model. Uh, so you can define this model of agnostic learning. Um, in this case, um, uh, the concept class C is, is the space of possible hypotheses rather than the space of target functions. Uh, and you're trying to find now a hypothesis whose error with respect to the target distribution is not much worse than the optimum in your concept class. Um, and the classical sample complexity of agnostic learning is known. It's uh, essentially d over epsilon squared, where d is the VC dimension of your, of your hypothesis class C. Uh, notice that this means that the generalization error epsilon in this case goes like one over the square root of the amount of data you're given rather than one over the amount of data. And this actually corresponds to a lot of realistic machine learning that error tends to go down like this one over square root of the number of data. Uh, and what we showed with Srinivasan by essentially the same proof techniques is that the same uh, lower bound on the number of samples for agnostic learning also applies for quantum examples. So again, if you want to do distribution independent agnostic learning, you know, you might as well just throw away the quantumness of your, of your examples, which again is kind of disappointing. Um, and it's which, also built on um, like um, error correcting code and, and making sure that there is distance artificially. Yeah, but the analysis is somewhat different and it has to be because it has like a worse epsilon dependence than the tight bound for usual pack learning. Good, so this is what I wanted to say about, um, about supervised learning, like in sort of different incarnations of the pack model with quantum data. There are a lot of other results here as well. I have a survey paper with uh, Srinivasan about uh, quantum learning theory where you can find much more. And now I want to switch gears a little bit to a very interesting toolbox, uh, which people in quantum machine learning are using all the time, or at least they say they're using it all the time. They want to use it all the time. And this is a sort of quantum approaches to linear algebra problems. Uh, and this is an extremely tempting idea. The idea is that uh, often in machine learning, you know, your data is like long vectors. If you think, for instance, of a picture of pixels, you know, you sort of stack the different columns below each other, and you can just think of your input as a vector. And if you're given many pictures as inputs, labeled or unlabeled, um, then, then you have many vectors as inputs. And the idea is to sort of think of a vector, um, normalize it so that it has Euclidean norm one, and then just treat it like a quantum state. For instance, if you have a vector of two to the k dimensions, right, this, and it's a unit vector, you can think of this as a k qubit quantum state. So you sort of achieve an enormous amount of compression because a, a two to the k dimensional classical vector somehow becomes a k qubit quantum state, where the vector of amplitudes of the quantum state is your original data vector, right? And then you can apply these quantum states with unitaries. Um, and an early example of this is the HHL algorithm, the Harold Hesedim Lloyd algorithm, which can solve um, linear systems of equations uh, quite efficiently in some weak sense of the word solve. Uh, and what this does is, um, right, so the input here is a matrix A in some form and a vector B in some form, and you need to find the vector X such that AX equals B. You want to solve the linear system, 
And if you assume that A is non-singular, then you know what X should be. It's A inverse times B. So that's basically what you want to produce here. And these things could be large dimensional. So doing this classically could be quite expensive. Uh, and in the quantum case, what the HHL algorithm does is, is it has a number of assumptions, including that the sort of the right-hand side vector B can be prepared efficiently as a quantum state. That's a strong assumption. And also that, that we can implement the unitary e to the i a that corresponds to our matrix A. Uh, and, and if you can do this, for instance, using Hamiltonian simulation techniques, which, which will be efficient in some cases, for instance, if A is a sparse matrix. And under these assumptions, you can quite efficiently uh, compute the solution vector of your linear system as a quantum state. You also need to assume something about the condition number of A. It shouldn't be too much out of whack. So under a lot of assumptions, you can sort of convert a quantum version of the vector B into a quantum version of the solution vector X, right? And if you just want the solution vector X written down on a piece of paper, that's not so great, but maybe you don't want that. Maybe you just want some, some, some specific properties of X that you could obtain by a quantum measurement on the state cat X. That's kind of the hope of the HHL algorithm. Um, and I don't think there has been a sort of killer ap application uh, of this algorithm where, where all the conditions are satisfied and, and you can really sort of satisfy both the assumptions on the input as well as the usefulness of, of, of getting out the solution as a quantum state. Still, I think it's a beautiful idea. Uh, and a more modern generalization of this is the so-called block encoding approach. Uh, and here the idea is that you, uh, you wanna sort of do something with a matrix A this matrix A could be Hermitian or unitary, but it need not be. It could even be non-square. It could be all sorts of things. You, you do want it to have operator norm at most one. And under that sole assumption, uh, there will always exist a unitary uh, of larger dimension that has the matrix A as its upper left corner. If A has operator norm at most one, you can embed it as the, cor as the upper left corner of a unitary. Um, and in many cases, for instance, if, if A is sparse or it has some other properties, you can actually have a very efficient circuit that implements this unitary U. And why is this good? It's good because if you want to sort of apply this matrix A to some quantum state, which strictly speaking doesn't even make sense if A is not unitary, but you still want to do it, you can do that with this block encoding. So what you do is you, um, oops, you start with, um, let's say you want to apply your, your matrix A to a state Psi. What you do is you tag on an extra qubit zero, you apply this unitary U to it. And the effect of that is a superposition where one branch of the superposition, namely where the first qubit is zero, actually has A Psi in its second register, right? And then you can try to combine this with things like amplitude amplification or whatever you want to do with this. Um, and this block encoding uh, formalism is, is very versatile. It allows you to add matrices. It allows you to multiply matrices. And even more strongly, uh, it also allows you to very efficiently apply low degree polynomials to this matrix A. This is called the singular value transformation, which is uh, due to Andres Gillian and Yuan Su and some other people. Um, so if you have a low degree polynomial for A, you can efficiently apply it in the block encoding form. And for instance, if you want to implement HHL in this way, what you do is you, you find a low degree polynomial that, that approximates the inverse function, one over X. You apply that function to your matrix, you get a new matrix where the upper left corner is A inverse. And this is very good because you, you can now apply A inverse to the state cat B and solve the problem that HHL will solve. Uh, if you wanna do Hamiltonian simulation, you can think of the matrix A as a Hamiltonian and the low degree polynomial that you would do would be some low degree polynomial that approximates e to the i x, right? If you, if you do this block encoding and you do the singular value transformation, you get a new matrix, a unitary matrix, whose upper left corner is e to the i h, which is exactly what you want to achieve in Hamiltonian simulation. So this is a pretty broadly applicable uh, um, uh, scheme and some people even call this the grand unification of quantum algorithms because almost everything you want can be sort of recovered from the block encoding mechanism. You can also design new quantum algorithms using this 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 formalism. I think it's a like extremely useful tool to know. And there are problems with this whole quantum linear algebra approach. You can already see them in HHL. Uh, usually it's assumed that the input is, is either in quantum form or can be efficiently transferred into quantum form, which might be not a practical assumption. Uh, 
Usually the output is produced as in quantum form, which may or may not be useful. And last but not least, some of these things have been dequantized in the sense that um, like, I think also the, um, the um, Kiranidis Prakash um, um, system, which was dequantized is an example of that. But a few years ago, there was a flurry of papers mostly involving Ewen Tang, uh, where a lot of these uh, quantum linear algebra based algorithms were sort of dequantized, like under some classical input assumptions that were not too different from the quantum input assumptions, you could actually do a classical algorithm achieving the same thing, sometimes assuming that the matrix is low rank. Um, and I want to do one early example of quantum linear algebra, like this slide here is basically like a meta approach, but I want to do one concrete example because I think it's beautiful. Uh, and this is um, due to Lloyd, Mozini and Ribbentrost, and this is quantum principle component analysis. Uh, and it suffers from all the problems that I mentioned. Uh, it, it assumes the input to be quantum. It produces the output as quantum. You don't really know what to do with it. It's also dequantizable, but I still think it's beautiful. So I want to present this thing here. Um, so what is principal component analysis? Uh, this is a pretty general and useful technique in machine learning or more generally in computational linear algebra. So what, you, what, you, what happens is you're given a bunch of vectors. This is your input, v1 up to vm, in let's say in large dimension. Um, and you want to reduce this large dimension to something much smaller like k so that you get data that's more compact and easily or more cheaply manipulable. Um, and one way to do this is, to, uh, is to, to look at this matrix A here, which can be called the correlation matrix of the data. It's a square d by d matrix. And it sort of incorporates all the data vectors. Um, and somehow if you, can, you can find the eigenvectors of this matrix and with associated eigenvalues. And somehow the, the k biggest ones where the eigenvalues are biggest, these are the most important directions in your, in your data. And one way to do dimension reduction is to find those top k eigenvectors uh, that gives you a basis of, uh, of k elements and to project all your data vectors onto these k elements, right? This achieves dimension reduction from d to k. And classically, you can find these, these eigenvectors and eigenvalues by doing a singular value decomposition on the matrix A. A is a d by d matrix, so this costs you time polynomial in d, which is not bad. I mean, polynomial time is good from a theoretical perspective, but if d is large, then doing singular value decomposition on a d by d matrix is still kind of painful. Uh, so the idea of Lloyd, Mosseni, and Ribbentrost was to, to somehow do this in a quantum way much more efficiently. Right, so, so here's the input assumption. Suppose that, that's, that these vectors, v1 up to vm, are unit vectors, and we can actually prepare them efficiently as a quantum state. But these are d-dimensional unit vectors. They, they correspond to log d qubit states. And let's make the heroic assumption that we can actually efficiently prepare ket vi which would be the, the log d qubit quantum state that has the amplitudes whose amplitude vector is pi. Now, if you do this uniformly at random for a uniformly random chosen i, right? So I pick my i classically at random between one and m and I prepare the state ket vi. And I think of this as a mixed state. The mixed states look like this row. What is this row? This, this up to scaling, this just is my correlation matrix. In the particular, that means that the eigenvectors of the correlation matrix A are the same as the eigenvectors of this density matrix rho. And the eigenvalues are also the same, but scaled by a factor of M. So now our, our goal somehow becomes to sort of take this quantum state, do something quantum with it, and extract the K most important eigenvectors from this quantum state. Uh, so that's, that's what Lloyd, Mosini, and Ribbentrost did. Um, so quantum PCA um, is a track of extracting the, the top K eigenvectors as quantum states, right? This is the second disadvantage. The output of this algorithm consists of quantum states. It's not totally clear what you're going to do with it. Uh, and what they did is they, they did phase estimation on a copy of rho. So what you do is you take a copy of rho. This has a certain spectral decomposition into eigenvectors. What you do is you estimate the eigenvalue for each eigenvector. So you now get a two register state, which is a sum over the eigenvectors with their associated eigenvalue. If you now measure the second register, you actually get the eigenvalue. And in your first register, you get the corresponding quantum state. And so if you could do phase estimation, um, 
you can actually sort of, and you do this repeatedly, let's say order k times, you can actually identify or ob obtain as quantum states these eigen eigenvectors. Um, and how do you do that? Well, if, if you want to do phase estimation, you need to do um, you need to be able to implement a unitary, which has this which actually has the eigenstates that you're interested in. Um, in particular, such a unitary would be e to the i rho. Right? This sort of looks like Hamiltonian simulation, except that we're given rho as a quantum state, not as a classical, not in a classical description. So then they have this very nice trick, and that's why that's what I really like about this, and why I want to present it, uh, where you sort of pull yourself up by your own hair by using copies of rho to implement the unitary e to the i rho. And I'm not going to sort of show in detail how this works, but it is possible to implement a little bit of this unitary. Let's say instead of e to the i rho, you implement e to the i rho delta for some very small delta. You can do that with very small error. Uh, using only one copy of rho. Uh, and if you can implement e to the i rho delta, and you do this t over delta many times, you've actually implemented e to the i rho t. And that's good. These are the kinds of unitaries you want to do for phase estimation. So consuming a lot of copies of rho, you can implement these unitaries. And then you can do these unitaries to do phase estimation on yet another copy of rho. And so this is called self-analysis. And it means that using a bunch of copies of the state rho, you can actually kind of decompose rho into its eigenstates. Uh, and if you do this repeatedly, you, you're going to get copies of the most important eigenvectors of uh, or eigenstates of rho, which also happen to be the most important eigenvectors of the data matrix A. And it's not super clear how useful this is, but I think there are ideas in here that are extremely both beautiful and useful elsewhere, which is why I wanted to present this as as one example of quantum linear algebra, right? You can see why I call this quantum linear algebra. You get these classical data vectors, you treat them as quantum states, you operate on them with quantum operations and you get out quantum states that may or may not be useful. Okay, I have um, about five minutes left. So let me spend those on, um, on optimization algorithms. So I mentioned that machine learning is data plus optimization. And so far I've been talking about cases where the data either is quantum, like in quantum pack learning, or can easily be turned into quantum, like in this quantum PCA. But in many cases, this is not very reasonable, right? Like typical machine learning takes enormous amounts of classical data. We certainly don't have enormous amounts of quantum bits. Um, so in many cases, we'll somehow have to do something with, with data that is inherently classical that cannot be put in superposition in any reasonable amount of time. So then we can still try to sort of use our quantum computer to get some benefits for the second part of the equation, namely the optimization. Um, and there's a, I actually gave a talk last year at the Simons Institute uh, about quantum optimization algorithms. Uh, let me refer you there if you want to have a more of an overview. For now, I just want to sort of quickly go over some of the speedups, quantum speedups that we know for optimization problems. So optimization, you can sort of split it into discrete optimization where you're, you're optimizing over bits or integers and continuous optimization where you're optimizing over real numbers, things that you can move continuously. And in discrete optimization, we have lots of speed ups, usually polynomial for graph problems, for string problems, uh, for tree search problems like backtracking, uh, for dynamic programming. And these typic are typically based on things like amplitude amplification and estimation. So things that are in the ballpark of Grover's algorithm, but then fancier generalizations thereof. Um, and there's a lot of useful stuff there. There's also speed ups for continuous optimization problems, for instance, um, for linear programs, for semi definite programs, uh, for matrix scaling and balancing, for linear regression. Uh, I'll talk a little bit more about linear regression on the next slide. Um, <coughs> And one important thing in continuous optimization is, is gradient descent. That's kind of the workhorse of continuous optimization. And this is the idea that you want to sort of minimize some continuous convex function f on n variables. And you can do it in an iterative fashion where you, you start at some point and then you move this point a little bit sort of greedily in the direction of steepest descent. So where you make most progress towards the minimum. And the direction of steepest descent is the negative gradient of your function. So the vector of, uh, of n partial derivatives. So what you wanna do in gradient descent is you compute this gradient 
that's a vector of n numbers, you put a minus in front of it and you move in that direction a little bit, right? And then there's all sorts of work that you can do about how big should the step size be, et cetera. Uh, but in any case, versions of gradient descent are the workhorse in op continuous optimization. And, and also for instance, in learning for uh, neural networks, which is not even a convex problem. So this is the idea of um, gradient descent. And there's a very nice algorithm called Jordan's algorithm, which can compute the gradient of a function much more efficiently uh, if that function is sort of close to linear. And of course, if your function is sufficiently smooth, then around your current point, in a small bowl around your current point, it will be kind of close to linear. Uh, I actually used this as an exam question three weeks ago, uh, which is not advisable. Like I think I uh, um, kind of uh, underestimated the difficulty of Jordan's algorithm. I think of it as a very beautiful, clean algorithm. It's just an application of a Fourier transform, but um, don't, don't try this in your exams. Um, okay, so just to sort of wrap up, I guess I have a few minutes left um, is, um, I want to present one, one recent result in, uh, in quantum optimization algorithms, namely uh, for the problem of uh, linear regression. So let's say that we're, we're given M points, X, uh, each point is of the form X comma Y, where X is, uh, is D-dimensional and Y is one real variable. And you wanna fit a line through them, right? This is one of the most basic problems in statistics and also machine learning, just linear regression. Um, so in other words, you want to find a vector of coefficients such that um, if you multiply that, those coefficients with the X part, you get a good predictor of the Y part. Right? This, this picture here represents the situation when D is equal to one, but in general, D could be much larger. Uh, and the typical uh, error that you want to minimize, I mean, typically there's no perfect line that will fit exactly through your point, so you need to minimize some error. And the typical error that is minimized is the so-called uh, sum of squares or average squared loss, least squares linear regression. And this has a closed form minimizer involving this, the, the more Penrose pseudo inverse of the, of the matrix that has sort of the, the X vectors as rows. But this is computationally costly and it also tends to overfit and, and yield a rather dense vector of coefficients. What, what you really want is that if, if only a few coordinates among the dx coordinates are relevant, that, that somehow your solution reflects this by having zeros in the other coordinates. So ideally you would like to, to end up with a sparse solution theta, like a solution that has a solution theta of coefficients that's mostly zero. And then from the non-zero, the few non-zero coordinates, you can actually see which parts of the x matter to predict the y. Uh, and one way to solve this is to sort of add regularization. For instance, you can uh, add the uh, L1 regularization, you get something called Lasso, famous method in machine learning and statistics. So here you wanna minimize this, this, this squared loss subject to the constraints that the sum of your coefficients is at most one in absolute value. So it's an L1 regularizer. This is just a repetition from the previous slide. Um, finding the exact minimizer is a hard problem. So typically, you know, it's like in agnostic learning, you're sort of happy with something that's like epsilon close to the best solution. So, you know, want to find a vector L theta, which uh, such that its average squared loss is no epsilon, is at most epsilon worse than that of the best predictor. Um, and the best classical algorithm to find such a theta vector runs in time roughly D over epsilon squared. Um, so with uh, my student, Jian Lin Chen, we, we found an algorithm that, that kind of speeds up in terms of the dimension. So we, we, we find such an epsilon optimal theta vector in time squared of D over epsilon squared. And we do this by speeding up the, the classical Frank Wolf algorithm using a whole bunch of quantum tricks. Um, you might think that the squared of D improvement is just Grover, but it's really a stack of different things involving all sorts of amplitude estimation versions of the kirinidis prakash data structure, et cetera. And we have a lower bound, which is not quite tight. Um, so there's still some, some open problems here. Um, as a byproduct of our research, by the way, we also showed that this classical D over epsilon squared is, is optimal for classical algorithms, which apparently wasn't known before. Despite the fact that the paper that introduced Lasso got 45,000 uh, uh, citations. So some, somebody must have thought about this. Okay, uh, then there's more heuristic methods. Um, I am out of time. This is my last real slide, Tom. Should I continue or? Yeah, sure. Okay, good, thanks. Um, 
Um, so the, the last slide is, is about variational methods, and, and this, this is getting a lot of attention, so I, 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 would be, uh, I would be a bad speaker if I didn't at all mention it. It's not really my forte, these, uh, these heuristic methods. But the idea of these variational methods is that you sort of use classical methods around a small quantum computer to optimize over some parameterized quantum circuit. So the picture which I stole from the web looks like this. There's a quantum circuit, that's the blue part, and it has a bunch of parameters. Um, you could think, for instance, that uh, sort of all, all the gates are already in place, but the angles of the quantum gates are parameters, uh, theta one up to theta, theta n, say, if they're n parameters. And those are the ones you want to optimize. And the idea is that you, you start this quantum circuit on the all zero state, this produces a final state, you measure some property of the final state, and this property could, for instance, correspond to um, the empirical error of some hypothesis in the learning context, or maybe the energy of a state in the case of quantum chemistry. Uh, and then you try to adjust your parameters theta in order to reduce this expectation value of your measurements. So that's the green part. The green part is kind of the, uh, the classical outer loop. Um, and this is somewhat similar to neural networks in the sense that you have a parameterized model uh, where you kind of iteratively try to improve the, uh, the parameters in order to achieve the performance of the model. All right, and the selling point of this, of this approach is that the blue part can be as small as, as, as whatever our current technology allows. In principle, you don't really need a large quantum computer for that. If you have, let's say, 20 good qubits that are reasonably stable, you could make the blue part out of 20 qubits and try to do variational methods to solve a problem in optimization or machine learning or quantum chemistry. Uh, and like with neural networks, it's, it's kind of hard to prove things about such methods, which is why I call them neural network, uh, call them heuristics. And unlike classical neural networks, we also can't implement them to see that they work, right? Uh, like neural networks uh, have been a big success the last 10 years, not because they are deep, rigorous, proven results about them, but just because they work in practice. And they work in practice because people implement them on massive data sets and they actually produce great predictions. Uh, and that's not really something <coughs> we can currently do with quantum variational methods. Maybe we can five years from now, but we can't really do that today. So I, I find it hard to sort of um, assess these methods. I think there are some interesting ideas in, in here. On the other hand, these, these things by themselves don't justify being called a killer app yet of quantum computers. We just don't know too much uh, about them yet. So here's my summary slides. Um, machine learning is data plus optimization. If you care about quantum improvements for this, the data could be made quantum, the optimization process could be made quantum or both. Quantum data can be useful, for instance, for learning under the uniform distribution. Um, Sample complexity does not improve from quantum examples in distribution independent back learning. A quantum linear algebra is a beautiful toolbox that can help you to efficiently extract properties of your data as quantum states, if you can prepare your data as quantum states. So both the input and the output tend to be quantum here, which is um, a blessing and a curse at the same time. And lastly, there's a growing body of quantum speedups for all sorts of optimization problems. Uh, some of it is rigorous, some of it heuristic, and much of this could be applied to machine learning problems. So let me thank you for your attention, and I apologize again for going a few minutes over time. <laughs>